I don't want to take too long to introduce our guest speaker. You'll get to know him as he speaks and uh, know him a little bit, a little bit more tomorrow, tonight and then a lot more tomorrow night. Uh, but I want to be able to give him all the time uh, that he's got today. Uh, about the time that Sarah and I moved here with our kids um, and started uh, working here at, at Hill Country Fellowship, uh, my friend Bill Pagrin and his son Rain came to visit. They were checking out colleges because Rain is brilliant and uh, wants to do stuff that I don't even know how to spell. But, uh, and uh, so he's, uh, he's checking out different colleges and, of course, uh, had to come to Texas because, uh, because of Texas A&M Aggies. Okay, I, t I told Bill if you say Texas A&M or you say Aggie, you'll just hear a, a random whoop all over the place. So it's a, and you, hear my, you might hear more at Hill Country Fellowship than in most places. Uh, just a lot of hoops over here. Um, uh, but uh, he actually got accepted, uh, Texas A&M, but uh, he's being recruited by other schools that are actually offering him more money. So that's, you know, I know as a dad, I'm like, take the money, son. Uh, but that, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but Bill Pagrin is an amazing man of God, an amazing drummer, great evangelist, but more than anything, he is a redeemed and transformed son who understands who he is in Christ, and he loves to share out of that. And so let's welcome up Bill Pagrin from Palmer, Alaska. And Jesus, I pray a blessing over Bill as he ministers the word to us today. I pray that we would hear the word and respond to it in whatever you have for us, Holy Spirit. Bless my friend and his message to us. You name me, pray. Amen. Love you, brother. It's all yours. Hey, hey love you too. Hey, what's the Yahweh, Yeah. I know some of you are looking at me with fear in your eyes after I said that. It's like, what did he say? Well, I'm going to tell you what I said, okay? I said, what's up, UT? That's my best Klingit Alaska native greeting. That's, what's up? <laughs> yeah, then I said, yachichet That means it is good to see your beautiful faces, eh? All right, turn to someone next to you and say, you look good. Now turn to them and say, but I look better. <laughs> ah, just kidding. Okay, I'll let you guys wrestle that one out. But uh, hey, it is great to be here and burn it. I love it here. This is my second time here, as Pastor Scott said. And, uh, you know, my son, Rain, we were checking out colleges, check checking out Texas A&M. He wants to be an aerospace engineer. It's kind of crazy. Jonathan, his son, He's, go, he's, he's studying to be a doctor. He's doing his internship now. And then my son's going to be a rocket scientist. And we're just musicians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but we're much more than that. But anyway, in my greeting, I also said something very important to me. I said that I'm young AD. I'm Eagle Wolf. I'm son of Raven Coho. But then I gave thanks to the one who made me. I gave thanks to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. You see, there was a little bit of fear in, in my heart as I started driving into Burnett, you know, because uh, as I came in, I saw this cowboy church. Yeah, I don't know, about 10 miles out or so, I saw this cowboy church, and I'm like, oh, no, stink, an Indian in cowboy land. I'm in trouble. But I am a techno skin. I got on my iPhone, and I started uh, is just sending an uh, urgent message to all my intercessors. Pray, cover me. They're circling the wagons. Help, help. I want to come out of this place alive. And uh, so I just want you to know that uh, I am here to encourage you today. <laughs> yeah, so traditionally, you know, if I wasn't, it, you know, the traditional clinket thing is when I come in, you know, I would, I would come in either backwards or forwards with the drum. I'd go, Hoo -ah! Hoo -ah! right? I do that. If I come in forwards, you're all in trouble. Okay? If I come in backwards, eh, 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 now it shows on my back. Usually I have my button vest and it shows my clan and I come in peace. Okay? I just want you to know, even though you didn't see any of that, I come in peace. There are just too many of you guys. Okay, 
And anyway, I want to have a good time, and I am so thankful for Pastor Scott, Pastor Jeremy, and now it's like Nathan and Lacey Steele. You got Gary Oath out and Carol. You guys are stealing all our best. Stop. No. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'll come visit anytime, but I'm not moving. Okay? It's important to know who we are. Amen? And it's important to know where we've been called to. Yeah? And I have been called to um, the, the places that not a lot of people like to go. You know, I go to these cold, dark villages in Alaska or the reserves in Canada. And, you know, every once in a while we get a good trip to somewhere warm, you know, like Peru or Hawaii or something like that. You know, but that's pretty rare. Sometimes we get to come to Texas, hey, get some good barbecue, that's good too. And if my son gets a, some amazing scholarships at Texas A&M, I might be coming and visiting more often. So, any of you guys have any connections? I'll be in the back, you know. Okay. Hey, it's tough. It's tough being a missionary, right? And then even worse for him being a missionary's kid, you know. So, anyway, you can pray for us for sure. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it is amazing to be here, and uh, I am just thankful that uh, that you guys are a friendly bunch, most of you. Um, I want today, I, I just believe that today, that something's going to happen in your spirit, that, that you may have heard some of these stories, you may have heard these words or these scriptures before, but I'm believing God to ignite something in your spirit, to reawaken you, to realign you, that there would be a fire that just like starts to burn in your heart, burn it, <laughs> you know, that something just starts to like really turn and burn in a new way that you become unstoppable. That is the goal of today, that you would see yourself how he sees you because when you do that changes everything one amen, amen. <laughs> all right well hang with me for a while you know um, but uh, you know some of you wonder what I'm wearing here you know this uh, this right here is my Billy Jack hat because <laughs> I'm serious about today and uh, actually this is my father's hat and I'm wearing that, but uh, I was thinking of the message today, and uh, the message today is, is going to be about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, to remind some of you what the good, bad, and the ugly is, you're going to watch a little video here, okay? That's good enough. That's good enough. You got the idea. How many of you remember the good, the bad, and the ugly? Yeah, that great Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef, and uh, see Sergio something or other. Anyway, when I said good, bad, and the ugly, others of you thought, oh, you mean Chris DeLorenzi, Jonathan Miracle, and Bill Pagaran? No, 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 no. No, no, no. We're talking about something else here, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, but here's something good. You know, there was... A beautiful, beautiful border collie dog, this female dog. She's just beautiful, perfectly groomed, right? And then there were these three male dogs that saw her. There was a bulldog, a Doberman pincher, and a chihuahua. And these guys saw how beautiful she was, and they really wanted to take her out on a date. They wanted her, and uh, so anyway, she knew that, so she came strutting by them, and she said, Whichever one of you can use the words liver and cheese the best in the same sentence, that is the one I will date. So then the bulldog just muscles his way up and says, I love liver and cheese. And she's thinking, that's dumb. And then the Doberman Pinscher goes, I got this. I hate liver and cheese. And she's thinking, that was just as dumb as the other one. And then the Chihuahua butts in and says, liver alone, cheese mine. 
I don't know how good that was. Here's, here's bad, though. You know, you heard about the cheese factory in France that exploded. There was nothing left but the debris. I know, that's really bad. <laughs> here's, here's ugly. Your mama's so ugly, she makes onions cry. Oh, I know that's ugly. Okay, this is not mine. Okay, I'm sorry. But anyway, I want to talk to you about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everyone say good news. Good news. Yeah, first of all, we're going to start with the good. The good news is, is that Jesus loves you. Yeah. The bad news is the devil doesn't. He doesn't like you. The devil doesn't like you. And the ugly is this, is that you deserve to die. Yeah, you know, you deserve to die. And, you know, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? But check this out. I want you to just, just remind you of a very familiar scripture. This contains the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, this is John 10, 10. In the message version, it says, A thief is only there to steal, steal kill, and and destroy but I Jesus came so that they might have real and eternal life more and better life than they even dreamed of Wow now that's pretty cool I think you know the devil he wants to take you out but Jesus not only wants to give you eternal life but he wants to impart something in your spirit through Holy Spirit that is even better than what you dreamed or even imagined that's pretty cool. Good news is that, you know, like I said, we all deserve to die. The good news is this, though, is that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were sinners, he died for us, right? Romans 5, 8. We know that scripture. And that he also, he that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white clothing, and I will not blot out his name in the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father, which is in heaven. That's good news, right? Everyone say good news. Yeah, bad news is once again that uh, every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. And the ugly is this, is Revelation 20, 15. It says this, this is really ugly, it's scary. It says, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I know, I, I can imagine like what, you know, living in the lake of fire would be like. And I kind of have just a little bit of idea what it means to like burn. You know, when I was uh, just about like six years old, do any of you remember like the, the Vicks cold vapor rub stuff that you had to boil and you, you know, you boil it and put it in a pot and you're supposed to breathe it in. It's supposed to clear your sinuses and everything up. Well, back, you know, way, way, many, many moons ago, I had one of those big pots of boiling hot Vicks next to me as I was coloring. And then I hit the, hit the pot and it went all over my arm. So I had third degree burns and it was just like really ugly. But this is how I became a drummer. Because it was so hot, it was like, you know, flesh peeling. And I was like, like this, all the way from my house to the hospital. I became the fastest seven-year-old, six-year-old drummer ever. Really. Anyway, part of that's true. Part of that story is true. <laughs> I won't tell you what part. Doesn't matter, though, anyway, really. But, uh, hey, you know, what I really want to do is I want to focus on some good news. Everyone say good news. Yeah. Here's some good news. Is the Lord is not slack concerning his promise to you, his promise to us, as some count slackless, but uh, he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. He doesn't desire any of us to burn in that lake of fire. His desire is a heart of love for you, for every person. He desires to love you to life. He desires to give you this gift of eternal life. And his desire is that none, everyone say none. none. Not one of us is his design for us to perish, but for us to have eternal life and to have that life that we've dreamed of having. So this is what I really, really want to focus on today is that kind of life. Is that life that, uh, that we have the opportunity of having in Christ. 
Now, uh, before I get to that part of the message, I'd like to just uh, share a little bit about the ministry that I'm so honored and privileged to do. It's called Carry the Cure. And Carry the Cure is a nonprofit based in Alaska, but Carry the Cure goes worldwide. I mean, we've been to Mescalero. Where are my Mescalero friends, huh? Anyone out there? I got a few. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, Carry the Cure has been through different communities throughout the United States, through Canada. We've been overseas. And everywhere we've gone, we've carried the message of hope, of life, and of destiny. And uh, we, we give this message to encourage young people. We give them reasons to live and to commit to life. That's our main program. And then we share the gospel everywhere we go. And we are seeing amazing things happen. Uh, but just think about that for a moment. I could spend a lot of time explaining all the different things we do in Carry the Cure, but I'd rather have you just watch this short video. In 1925, there was an epidemic of diphtheria that threatened to wipe out Western Alaska. And they developed this serum, uh, but the only way to get it to them uh, was by brave dog mushers who raced across Western Alaska to Nome. And they did that successfully. The cure is the gospel of Jesus Christ, so we need to carry the cure to the villages of Alaska. My heart is uh, for a healed Alaska, and I believe that that's possible. And if we carry the love of Jesus, then uh, I believe we can reverse the negative statistics in Alaska, and we can see life rise up in the young people. As we go with Carry the Cure, we go carrying the love and with a desire to see uh, a great conversion take place, a great conversion of the heart. And I'm really starting to see a marked difference in the, in the children and the adults. I'm starting to see joy return into their spirits. I hear a lot of young people here in our community talk about wanting to kill themselves, wanting to end their lives because they feel like they have nothing. And I'm so glad I saw one of the students that were feeling that. And he was here and that was so uplifting. He walked out looked like with a big smile. You don't see too many of our youth coming to church. But when this came to our community today, uh, the music, all of that drew them in and they were intrigued by that, I know. But the message that was given about what Christ can do. I see the future of our youth. It's just gotten bright, brighter here. I, I know that much. Giving that personal testimony, seeing where people have been and, and where they've come from and where they're at now and how they're living for the Lord and they're excited about life, I think really has an impact on a lot of kids and a lot of adults. And, and we see that every year on the trips as people come forward uh, and accept the Lord into their hearts. It was so high energy that it kept every student from kindergarten through 12th grade riveted on what was being said. They were glued to what was being said, what was being sung, all the instruments. It was just a, a great experience. I saw the community coming together in, in dance and celebration, which was a big encouragement. The program was very passionate. It gives uh, the kids especially hope for a brighter future. And I just thank Lord once again that um, you are here. The ministry of Carry the Cure. And uh, I need to tell you that I am not ashamed to be Hunget, to be Alaska Native. But even more important than that, I am not ashamed to be a child of the Holy One. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Like it says in Romans 1.16, for it is the power of God. Everyone say power of God. 
Guys, it is the power of God to those that believe. And it doesn't matter if you're black, white, polka dot, or stripe, every tongue, tribe, and nation. Jesus died for us all. And it's that power that comes to take up resident inside of us. And wow, when we get that, wow, then we are no longer ashamed because, man, his love will take over. It casts out all that shame and that hurt and that pain. But I want to tell you that, you know, you may think that I'm a crazy clinket right here. I'm, I'm clinket and I'm Filipino. I'm a clinkapino. And you might think I'm crazy, but you know, I wasn't always like this, you know, because when I was young, I was so full of pain, shame, and hurt. I wouldn't even look at you in the eyes because I was so full of this stuff and hurt. And a lot of these things, they weren't my choice. It wasn't my choice. I didn't ask for it. I mean, I was so full of shame that I had long hair back then, but I would have to talk to you through the parts of my hair. Because I thought if you looked into my eyes, you would know all that stuff. And I need to tell you that there is a great need in our nation today. There are thousands of young and not so young that don't know that they're beautifully, fearfully, and wonderfully created. It doesn't matter if you're four or 84. The message that the Holy One has for us is a message of hope and life and love and beauty for you. But many don't understand that. And I didn't understand that. See, when I was four years old, my uncles used to bet whether I could take a hit off a marijuana joint. They used to bet whether I could take a shot of tequila. Seven years old, my parents divorced. Eight years old, I was already addicted to marijuana. My own mother was my dealer, my supplier. My home was so messed up from the beginning of the day to the end of the evening. Had four sisters, no brothers, one bathroom. That's bad, but then what's worse is that I saw my sisters hurt, mistreated, and abused. My mom working three jobs to support a family of five. Things got so bad in my home that by the time I was 12 years old, my own mother signed legal documents and she gave me away to a complete stranger who abused me in about every way you could think of, physically, sexually, mentally, verbally. I was abandoned, rejected. I felt like trash. I was worthless. That's what I felt. I felt that there was no good reason for me to live. So many times I felt like giving up. I felt like committing suicide. But, there's a good but. <laughs> there were people that did little things that made a big difference in my life. So I don't want you to underestimate the simple things that you might do in public, whether it's a simple hello whether it's buying someone's groceries, just being kind and being nice to someone might save a life because it did mine. And because of that kindness that other people showed me, I'm here today with a smile on my face. I'm here because I had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to encounter the one who created me. And now I'm free from the pain, free from the drugs and alcohol, free from the shame, free from the stupid things I did to myself, and free from the things that other people did to me. Before I met Jesus, though, I mean, I, I love uh, playing music. I love percussion. Anything that you hit, man, I love it, <laughs> right? And so I was classically trained. So in, you know, in high school, growing up in high school, I played in the orchestra, and I also loved jazz. So it's like I love jazz, any type of music. I, I even played polka. <laughs> I had Lederhosen and long hair, and I was playing in the polka band. I love music so much. But one, one time I was in this village in Alaska. It was way up north. And not a lot of people there, but this is before I met Jesus. And then at the uh, end of the orchestral concert, the students were all invited to come and talk to the different musicians, right? You know, so, so at the end, you know, the conductor said, yeah, if you would like to know more about the flout or the flautist, you know, or the clarinet or the stringed instruments, just come on up and you can talk to our musicians. Well, it was pretty awesome because, you know, 
and scary because like, you know, one or two people would go to the flautist, you know, and then someone over to the cellist and, you know, a few other people to like the trumpets. And, but then all the other kids swarmed around the timpani. And I'm like, ah, remember, I'm a little bit shy, you know, and I, you know, this is before Jesus. And they all swarmed around the drums and they were asking about the drums and wanting to try it. So I'd let them try it. I talked to them about the drums and stuff like that. And it was really cool. At the end of that time, all the students left and then the principal came up to me and he said this, he said, Bill, there's not one student here at this school that has not been abused. And I'm thinking, why did you tell me? This is before Jesus. What could I do about it? Well, shortly after that time, I had this incredible encounter with Jesus a couple years later. And in that encounter, I was just like, oh God, <laughs> thank you so much for freeing me from all this hurt and pain and shame that I've carried in my life. Thank you for giving me your love that I could forgive my mother, my father, my sisters, and even the one who abused me. I got to lead them all to the Lord Jesus shortly after I gave my heart to the Lord. I got to baptize them in water. And you know, like I said, I even got to lead the very one that abused me to the Lord Jesus. That's powerful love. And, you know, as I was considering this, though, I was just like, I was thanking the Lord for just freeing me. And as I was just like, Lord, I would do anything. Lord, I, I, I'm not a great speaker. I can play the drums. <laughs> I knew I could do that. But anything you could do, any way that you could use me, take me back to those places where those students and families are hurting and broken. And if there's anything that I could do, anything that I could say, use me. And so the good thing is, is that God has like made that possible. And even beyond that, he's, he, he's so good guys. He's so full of love that he, when we delight ourselves in him, he grants us the desires of our heart. And he even goes beyond that. You know, since all that time, you know, I, I was able to play, perform, and record Christian music in Nashville and do touring there for a while. Then I moved back to Alaska and I thought, wow, my music days are all over. Shortly after that, I meet uh, Jonathan Miracle and Chris DeLorenzi. And see, Jonathan is from Tyndanaga, Ontario, Canada. Do you know how far away that is from Alaska? I live in Palmer, Alaska. <laughs> These guys, you know, Thunder Bay and, and Tyndanaga, Ontario, Canada, that's like about 4,000 miles away from me. How do you have a successful band like that? <laughs> well, God does amazing things. I could just, we could go on and, you know, we could probably tell more stories. Maybe Monday. I don't know. Maybe tomorrow night. But God has made this thing work out. And we played in stadiums. We played in all kinds of different festivals like Life Light, you know, a small festival, about 70,000 people. You know, we get to travel the world sharing our music and sharing our message. But it was because really what happened was that moment of surrender. And I want to encourage you in this, you know, is that when we surrender, when we fully surrender to him, then we can find out what he can do. You know, everywhere I go, I, I ask this question. I, I kind of ask it to myself and I ask students. I ask this, I ask, who are you and what? were you born to do? Now, when we understand who and whose we are, wow, that changes some stuff right there, guys. When we understand that we, like it says in, in Ephesians 2.10, it says that we are workmanship 
created in Christ Jesus, which God prepared for in advance, good works for us to do. Now that tells me right there that there's not one person here, not one, that's an accident. There's not one person that's a whoops, a mistake, or a loser in this room that God fearfully and wonderfully and beautifully created each and every one of you, and he created you with a purpose. There's something amazing that each of you are born to do. So now what we need to figure out is, what is it? <laughs> right but once you get that first part in your heart is that ah he loves me oh he created me with a purpose then he starts to reveal as we start walking with him he starts to reveal those those dreams from childhood those deposits of gifts and talents and abilities that he starts to put together that puzzle for us he starts to help us to walk it out so that we can fulfill what he's, he's created us to do. See, I'm convinced of this, church, is that right here in front of me, right here in this church, that there are enough people to change the world in a good way. <laughs> now, how many of you guys know that we live in a messed up world? Yeah, we live in a messed up world. All kinds of stuff going on. Um, you know, the, the tragedy in Florida, I know is, is really on many of our hearts. And we're praying for those families, praying for uh, the brokenness and, you know, praying for healing to happen. But I, I, I can't help but think, what if that young man that took all those 17 people out, what if he knew who he was? What if someone took the time to say hello? What if he didn't feel invisible? See, that's what happened to me when I was a high schooler and I was ready to give up. But it's like I'd walk through the halls thinking, this is it. I can't deal with this pain and the shame and the hurt anymore. I would say, this is the last time I'm going to see that teacher, that student. I just want it all to end. <laughs> and so I, I came close to committing suicide many times. But then there'd be that one little thing that made all the difference in my life. But what if someone did that to this young man? What if? You know, because instead of hurting himself, he hurt other people. Now, I know this is a heavy thing right now, but what I'm saying is, is something good. It's because Christ in you, Christ in me, is the hope of glory. And once we understand who we are, whose we are, and what we were born to do, part of that message is sharing that with other people. You know, and, and giving hope that's in you that can change, radically change the course of people's lives. But like I said, we live in a messed up world and this whole messed up world that we live in, it goes, the problems go way, way, way back, all the way to Adam and Eve, right? But I was thinking about this the other day and I was thinking, what if Adam and Eve were native? If Adam and Eve were native, we wouldn't have any of these problems. <laughs> yeah, because if Adam and Eve were native, they wouldn't have eaten the apple. They would have eaten the snake. <laughs> and they would have made moccasins out of them. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> I know, we're all messed up, but <laughs> but his love, his perfect love, if we accept it, casts out the fear, right? Perfect love casts out fear. The fear of man, the fear of not measuring up, the fear of not making it in the world, 
not being good enough. Really, if you allow that perfect love to come into your heart, it changes everything. Church, you carry the cure. You have within you the ability to change the world. You have the ability to change your life if you surrender to Jesus, your family, a community, a state, even this nation. And how many of you would like to see a healed world? An end to suicide, an end to all this uh, domestic violence and this tragedy. You'd like to see an end to alcohol and drug abuse. Yeah, you'd like to see an end to that. Well, if you want to see a changed world, a changed world begins with a changed man or a woman. We surrender first. So God did a pretty crazy thing with me not too long ago. Um, it was uh, kind of like this message that Jesse was uh, shared with us. It was pretty awesome. Instead of hills, like you have in Burnett, in Alaska, we have mountains. So I have to hike a long ways to get up to these mountains. And one day as I was hiking up this mountain, the Lord just brought my attention to this field that was on the side of the mountain. He said, Bill, it's harvest time. And I'm going, ah, it's always harvest time. I'm an evangelist. No, he goes, no, Bill. This is harvest time in Alaska. It's harvest time in this nation. And what I'm about to do is I'm about to pour out my spirit in unprecedented ways, and you will see families, communities, and even a whole state come to the knowledge of Christ. He said, what I'm about to do is pour out my spirit on my sons and my daughters, and they'll start to do unthinkable things, things that they've only dreamed or even imagined of doing. Because this is a special season, and this is a time of my harvest. And so I started arguing with the Lord, you know, because he was saying he was like, he was challenging me to start a movement in Alaska called AK One Day. And the movement was, is this, is to take the gospel to every man, woman, boy and girl in every town, city and village in Alaska. And he said, as Alaska goes, so goes the nation. I know those are some pretty bold words, uh, you know, here. But I believe what he's doing here in Texas, what he's doing here in your congregation, is a parallel thing. It's a, it's a season and a time that we have. We have an opportunity to do things we've only talked and dreamed about. We have an opportunity to join in and actually walk out those words or prophecies that have been spoken about our areas. But as I was thinking about how outrageous, how crazy this is, a whole state, a whole nation, I got to the top of the mountain. I said, well, first of all, Lord, you got the wrong guy. So you got the wrong guy because it's like I'm not good enough. And you know what? I just uh, I, I yelled at my son yesterday and it's like, oh, man, I could start listing all the things that would disqualify me. I'm not good enough. You know, it's like oh, I messed up and, you know. But then I got on the top of this mountain, and I'm not kidding. I have videos of this. One day I'm going to have to show you, Pastor Scott, but this is like pretty crazy. I'm on the top of Lazy Mountain, and I'm wrestling with God on this. He knows where Lazy Mountain is. And there's a spot probably about as big as this part of the stage. It's a clear day, and God was saying, yeah, though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they're like crimson, I'll make them like wool. And it starts snowing on the top of the mountain on a clear day. What do you do with that? <laughs> this is the only thing I could do. And then he spoke these words to me. And I believe this is a message for you, a message for this church. You will try to disqualify yourself you will try to come up with reasons why you're not good enough. You haven't sat in the pew under the great teaching of this church long enough to be the cure or the answer for others out there. You may have other reasons or circumstances that you're thinking, you know, you're just not ready. But God says that you're ready. 
You are his. He delights in you. And this is what he said to me as I made my excuses. He said, Bill, the lower you go, the higher I'll lift you. He said, the weaker you are, the stronger I'll make you. And the more empty of yourself you'll become, the more I'll be able to manifest my glory in and through you. Then he said, go. Go. Church, it's time to go and share that good news. To share the love of Jesus. You know, for some of you, it may be a simple hello or buying someone's groceries. For others, you may feel more bold and you may want to share your testimony. And for some of you, it's simply living out your life and it's displaying God's glory in all that you do, even without words, beyond words. But it's a time to go and display the goodness of God. And I believe we're in this season of harvest. And I believe that if we will surrender. I mean, how many of you are tired of seeing what you can do on your own? I'm raising my hand. I am tired of seeing what I can accomplish and do on my own talents, gifts, and strengths and abilities. I want to see what he can do through a people who are surrendered. And I believe that, like it says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, even right here, right now, right today, that the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro right here at Hill Country Fellowship. He's searching to and fro to find those whose hearts are fully committed unto him so that he may strengthen them, so that he may strengthen you, so that he will cause you to do those things that you only dreamed of doing. This is good news, right? Is that good news? I'm telling you, when you get this kind of thing in your heart, Wow, then just like, you know, this, there's this turning and burning that starts to happen. And then you start to think, I'm unstoppable. I can do the things that he said I can do. I can say what he said I can say. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Use me. And he'll start to do those crazy God things through you. See, I look at you and I see an army of God lovers that can do that and even greater things. I see a people who have Christ in them, the hope of glory, that can change the world. Maybe change a student's life. Maybe a whole group. You know, we're about ready to launch out on our ninth annual Iditarod Outreach each year we charter planes and this year it's going to cost forty thousand dollars for us to visit nine villages in nine days with a team of nine and we're going to do those committed to life school assemblies in the morning and the night we're going to preach the gospel and i believe that god will do even greater things that we've seen already where we have seen literally whole gymnasiums full of people up to 500 even more people give their heart to the lord jesus christ in one night by coming and joining us on the gym floor surrendering their lives that's the kind of thing that's sweeping across our state and sweeping across other places that we go but i'm at, i'm going to ask you to pray for us to consider partnering with us as you sow he's going to sow it back in to this place Press down, shaken together, running over. He's going to bless your family, bless this church, and you will see increase in ways that you've only dreamed of. Church, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Um, I want to tell you, even in my short time here, I've grown to like you a whole bunch. I love you guys. I mean, I love your pastors here, but this is a pretty amazing place. You've made me feel like family. But, uh, but family can, can call each other to a higher place too. And I see that greatness in you. 
and God just wanting to rise up in you in greater and greater ways. So Lord, I thank you so much for my friends here and my family. And Lord, I pray right now that you would pour out your spirit on your sons and your daughters, that your love would pour into their hearts in a greater and greater and greater way, Lord, so that they will rise up, not in their own strength, but in your strength. And Lord, that they will do the greater things that you've called us to do. Lord, because you lived and you died for us, Lord. You've made a way for us for eternal life, but you've made a way for us as your ambassadors of heaven, ambassadors of your kingdom, as your sons and daughters to establish the kingdom of God right here, right now, right today. I ask that you do that, Lord. And Lord, I pray that if there are people that don't know that great and awesome, incredible love, Lord, I pray that you would call them, draw them to yourself today that this would be a day that they would never, ever forget. For us as believers, I pray that we could mark it on our calendar and say that this was a day that I launched out into the things that I said that I would do, that I dreamed of doing, that this is a day that I remember you doing impossible things through me. In Jesus' name, amen.